Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, today's Thursday. Um, we want to thank you for joining us for our leadership panel on promoting access and inclusion for learners of all backgrounds at UBC. We're happy to have you join us. And I would like to um, show this image we have up on the screen of three students standing on a stairwell looking at each other with today's session title. We will start in about a few minutes as we get more participants coming in from the waiting room. Thank you for your patience. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Celebrate Learning Week panel, promoting access and inclusion for learners of all backgrounds at UBC with UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan leaders. Uh, accessible and inclusive teaching practices and program design are essential to removing barriers to education for students of all backgrounds, including those with disabilities. And this panel will explore from a strategic level how inclusive teaching is being supported across both campuses. My name is Christina Hendricks. I'm a white woman with medium length brown hair and glasses sitting in an office. I'm the academic director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology at UBC Vancouver. And I'm also a professor of teaching in the Department of Philosophy. And I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement by acknowledging that I'm joining you from UBC Vancouver, which is located on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Some of you are joining from UBC Okanagan, which is on the territory of the Silks Okanagan people. And others may be joining from various other places in the country or possibly around the world. Now, in, in previous years, um, before COVID-19, we did have Celebrate Learning Week uh, uh, in person and brought people together in a physical space to share our ideas, thoughts, questions, and learning. And it may have been easier to think about the, the land on which we are gathered when we are in a physical space, but it's certainly no less important to consider and, and uh, reflect on when we're joining from multiple places with our own contexts and histories. So we're not um, meeting in the ether online, as it were, we're each of us rooted and physically located in a place with those joining from BC, most likely doing so from unceded indigenous territory and those joining from elsewhere also quite often on indigenous territory. For those of us who are guests on these lands, um, how can we act as good guests and contribute to decolonization and reconciliation? So one way to start is to learn more about the indigenous peoples and lands on which we live, work and play. And many indigenous nations have websites where folks can learn more about the nation and the lands, the history and the community's current activities. For example, if you are located um, uh, working at UBC Vancouver, the Musqueam Nation has a website that we will put into the chat which has educational resources that are really helpful for um, non-community members to learn more about the, the people, their culture, their language, their history, and their community. And the Silks Okanagan Nation website, also put into the chat, has information about their language, culture, and territory as well. And for those of us who work at UBC, we can also learn more uh, through uh, looking at the memorandum of affiliation that UBC Vancouver has with the Musqueam Nation and the memorandum of understanding that UBC Okanagan has with the Sioux Okanagan Nation. And these are important to, to, to pay attention to because they guide UBC's relationships with these communities on whose lands that our campuses are situated. Now, as we learn today about um, accessibility and inclusion in uh, the institution, let's also keep in mind that the institutional structures and practices we are including people into have been built upon colonial practices and values, and that UBC has made strong commitments um, to working towards reconciliation and decolonization through these memoranda of understanding and affiliation, through the indigenous strategic plan, working in partnership with local communities. They make commitments to uphold indigenous human rights and to take action in accordance with the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And it's all of our responsibilities at UBC to learn and act in accordance with these commitments. And uh, if you have not done so already, the UBC Indigenous Strategic Plan is a great place to um, to start and to think about the framework that all of us could locate our, our work into um, uh, at UBC. Uh, I encourage you to read and engage with the toolkits 
that are on the uh, Indigenous Strategic Plan website that help uh, can help each one of us as individuals locate how we can contribute to decolonization and reconciliation. Now, Celebrate Learning Week is an opportunity to recognize all the hard work, talent, and teaching and learning commitments and achievements at UBC. Throughout this week, UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan are working together to host a series of in-person and online events. The theme of this year's Celebrate Learning Week is promoting inclusivity and accessibility, and there's over 35 parts, um, uh, excuse me, there's over 35 events in Celebrate Learning Week, um, and they highlight accessibility for people with disabilities, along with inclusive learning, living, and working environments for students, faculty, and staff. So for a full list of events taking place this week, you could visit the Celebrate Learning website. Um, so housekeeping. We have a few housekeeping uh, items before we get started with our panel today. So we first, we invite you to participate in the session, however makes sense to you. You can keep your camera on or off. You can sit down, stand up, walk around, have a pet, um, whatever works the best for you. So please keep, however, your microphone muted when you're not speaking. And do note, as we mentioned at the beginning, this session is being recorded and it will be shared afterwards as a resource on the Celebrate Learning Week uh, wiki page. If you don't wish to be recorded, you can keep your camera and microphone off. Um, and the comments, just so you know, the comments and questions in the chat will not be recorded. So we will have a time at the end uh, for question and answers from the participants. So please hold your questions until the end of the session. Um, there'll be a Q&A period where you can either post your questions in the chat uh, in Zoom or raise your virtual hand to speak. And just to let you know, we have a couple of Q&A moderators for this session who are identified with a Q&A in their Zoom display name if you want to connect with them, but you can also just post your questions directly in the chat. If you're having any technical difficulties, our CTLT event staff are ready and here to provide you with support. So you can contact Suki Guman via the chat. Finally, there's automated closed captioning available and you can enable this feature by clicking on um, the CC at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'd like to um, introduce a community agreement. So if we could pull that slide up. Thank you. So to ensure open, inclusive and respectful dialogue and participation, we would like to, to have a community agreement that we would all um, pay attention to and abide by because using these sorts of practices, we can share and learn together and challenge ourselves and each other while still recognizing that we're coming from different places of knowing and transforming. So on the slide, there are um, uh, five words, let me count, yes, five words. <laughs> uh, with each, each one of them, I'll explain briefly. So first we would like to, uh, the first word is learning. We would like to acknowledge that we're all here to learn with and from each other. Second one is emotions. I'd like to acknowledge that discussions regarding diversity, inclusion, and discrimination can sometimes bring with them very strong emotions. And these can be felt by different people for very different reasons. Um, so those uh, who have lived experience of discrimination, harassment, and abuse, um, we recognize the labor of those who may choose to uh, share that with us. And we receive that with care. For those who do not have that lived experience, we invite us, we invite you and myself as well to lean into our discomfort um, uh, if this is bringing up difficult emotions and use it to guide our growth. The, the third word is recognition. We invite you to recognize and work with the emotions that come up in order to support our own learning and the learning of others. Fourth one is impact. We ask that we all listen to each other's perspectives and that we be accountable for the impact of our words, even if this is different from the intent of our words. And finally, responsibility. Um, we recognize that we're all responsible for an equitable, generative, and respectful dialogue. And facilitators in this session, including myself as hosts and our moderators, uh, are working to support this goal. So please join us in helping to set the pace for generative and respectful dialogue as you engage with the session today. 
And I would now like to introduce our panelists for this session. So as we're getting those folks um, up on the screen, I would like to, to say that unfortunately we had a couple of panelists who were not able to join us. So if you saw the, the list of folks early on, um, uh, Simon Bates, Associate Provost Teaching and Learning at UBC Vancouver, and Margaret Moss, Interim Associate Vice President of Equity and Inclusion at UBC Vancouver are not able to join us today. But we have a wonderful um, set of panelists here. So I'm going to introduce them. And then we have a couple of questions that we've prepared in advance to ask the panelists. And then after that, there will be a time for open question and answer period. So first off is Janet Mee, who's Interim Managing Director of Student Affairs at EBC Vancouver. Shirley Nakata, Ombudsperson for Students, Office of the Ombudsperson for Students at EBC Vancouver. Erlene Roberts, Manager, Disability Resource Center at UBC Okanagan. Janita Palverjan, Director, the Center for Equitable Systems Design and Extended Learning at UBC Vancouver. Brad Weatherick, Associate Provost, Academic Programs, Teaching and Learning at UBC Okanagan. And Mai Yesue, Interim Director, Education, Partnerships and Engagement, Equity and Inclusion Office at UBC Vancouver. So welcome to you all and thank you so much for joining us today. So as I mentioned, we have two discussion prompts um, and then later we'll be opening it up to questions from the participants. So I'd like to ask the panelists to please start their first response to the, the discussion prompt with a little bit more about themselves or, or their work at UBC. So the first question is what do inclusive and accessible practices look like in your context or role? And how do you promote inclusion and access in your role or unit? So I'm gonna start with Janet Mee um, and Erlene Roberts who um, have similar roles at both campuses. So please go ahead. I think shall I start with an introduction and then you can jump in and then we'll take off. So I'm Janet Mee, I'm the Interim Managing Director of Student Affairs in the Vice President Students Portfolio as Christina mentioned. Um, uh, my, uh, during my time at UBC, I've spent most of my time as the director of what is now known as the Center for Accessibility um, and have been working in the field of post-secondary education and disability for, gosh, almost 32 years, um, uh, most of which has been at at UBC actually in what was originally the Disability Resource Center. Um, just a little bit, I mean, personally, um, uh, I come uh, to this work as an educator. So I was uh, originally planning to be an elementary teacher um, and uh, have worked um, both with children, youth um, and adults with primarily learning disabilities but other forms of disability uh, for, for most of my uh, education uh, career, and then um, moved into post-secondary education and disability. And I'll turn it over to Erlene to introduce herself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Erlene Roberts, and I'm uh, on the Okanagan campus, uh, located in the unceded territory of the Okanagan Civics Nation. Um, I've been at UBC for a while, like for quite a while in different capacities as a student, way back in when we were OUC, I did my undergrad here, and then I've got a couple of other degrees from UBC over the years. Um, I've been working at the DRC, the Disability Resource Center at UBC Okanagan since 2010, um, and seen the center grow significantly um, over those years. We've worked like, I don't know, five times bigger than we were when I started. Uh, my background is in social work, <clears throat> so I, I have worked my entire career in some form of disability uh, services and supports uh, so for a number of years with the BC government and working for community living in BC as well. Uh, so that's most of my uh, working career has been in, in this field. We're just doing introductions at this point, right? So, okay. So John, I'll pass it back to you to start answering that. We're starting with the question. So pass it back to you if you wanna start. Sure, I think um, I think both Arlene and I thought it would be helpful to maybe just start with a grounding to recognize that you know um, the foundations of UBC, both educationally, structurally, 
um, uh, in terms of policy um, and um, in terms of the built environment are all built on a foundation of ableism um, and that that has a, a significant impact um, on the way we think about our work um, and the way that we um, that we we know that others come at um, the topics of inclusion and access for people with disabilities particularly. Um, uh, we also thought it might be helpful to acknowledge that there are um, uh, legislation and policies and and um, and commitments that are made both at the institutional level, at the provincial level, and even at the federal level, that have a that are driving forces um, for for some of our work. And and quite frankly, I think for us, um, provide the tool. Um, I would be the gracious way I might put it to to really um, push the boundary sometimes when we're talking about um, creating inclusive and accessible environments. One um, piece of legislation that I think is particularly relevant is the BC Human Rights Code. Um, so that code, um, unlike the legislation that Erlene is going to talk about, um, is really um, an aspirational vision um, or statement. So it it, it simply um, suggests or or aspires. Um, to create an bumped my keyboard. Um, to, uh, it, uh, the, the legislation is, is really meant to um, aspire to an environment where, um, in this case, people with disabilities can participate in all that society has to offer with dignity and independence. Um, and it does so by really se setting that standard um, and then um, applying a test over time um, through um, cases that come forward to the BC Human Rights Tribunal. Um, and so we work with those cases to understand um, what the societal expectations are um, and how UBC um, must adjust and adapt and work um, to, to meet those expectations as they evolve. Um, so <clears throat> the legislation <clears throat> has some benefits um, in that the bar is it's not a minimum standard. The bar is ever shifting. Um, and as societal expectations become greater, um, the expectations that come through the case law um, continue to expand. Um, it does have some disadvantages in that it doesn't set a minimum standard. So it's not always clear for folks when they have done enough in order to meet the expectations of the legislation. Um, and that can create some challenges, I think, for us in our work. Um, there's a new piece of legislation coming to BC, and Arlene's going to talk a little bit about that just to also kind of set the scene. So I'm going to talk about the um, Accessible British Columbia Act, which was enacted last year in June of 2021. And in the first year, the province has created their um, accessibility committee for the, for the government and province. And the recently have released the um, expectation that uh, public agencies in BC will also create accessibility committees, and that includes post-secondary institutions. And those committees are to be set up by September 1st. And so the, the, um, the composition of the committee is mandated and the work of the committee in the first, uh, over the first 10 years actually, are, is also mandated by this legislation. So UBC will be tasked with setting up this accessibility committee almost immediately, we're gonna to need to start working on that pretty quickly. Um, and uh, the standards that will be implemented over the 10 year period, the, the university, or sorry, the, um, the government will be de developing the standards, there's 10 standards to a year starting next year. And so our task as a university in the first year of our, for that um, accessibility committee will be to develop an accessibility plan for our university that encompasses all of the standards that are going to be developed. So we need to look at information systems, we need to look at spaces, we need to look at everything that basically that we do. And so uh, that legislation will also, um, in some ways, direct the work that we do as a university as a whole, but also what we do at the Center for Accessibility and the Disability Resource Center. And I might jump in to say, I mean, I think um, from our perspective, the, the legislation and also the commitments through the, the um, 
campus plans on both on both campuses and and the policies that we have in place both through um, the equity and inclusion office and through the center for accessibility and the disability resource center really call for us to work on on at least two levels probably more um, one would be um, at the individual level so certainly um, like on the Vancouver campus for example we provide accommodations or we facilitate accommodations for approximately 4,000 students with disabilities who've identified themselves to the center and are requesting some form of accommodation to participate in any facet of university life. So, so the policy that, that governs our work requires that we look at accommodations, not just for the academic environment, but for co-op or for an internship or for a student leadership opportunity or um, for a, a recreational activity. So we really at UBC are focused on ensuring that students are integrated and have the opportunity to participate in everything that UBC has to offer. We also work at a systemic level. So we have some resources to look at um, uh, various um, systemic barriers that people might face and to think about um, more universal responses um, and more inclusive responses to those kinds of um, uh, issues that come up. Um, one, certainly in the teaching um, realm um, and teaching and learning realm is the built environment. So looking at um, new standards for classroom and learning spaces, um, looking at uh, practices around um, the design of uh, both the teaching facility to ensure that, that instructors with disabilities are able to participate fully, but also looking at, at how um, teaching practices are changing and what that means for the for the built environment. So we're building on both campuses, I think, fewer and fewer large um, fixed seating lecture halls um, and more and more spaces that have um, uh, movable furniture and are able to adapt in order to accommodate the, the more interactive and participatory kinds of um, uh, learning environments. And that has some implications for changes um, to the way we design our classrooms and classroom services and the Center for Accessibility and the Disability Resource Center work really closely um, to um, create new standards um, and, um, and look at those pieces. Um, this The second, which I think um, maybe I would just highlight would be, um, we know um, from literature and research that sense of belonging has a huge impact um, on academic success and on learning and how students interact with their peers and interact with their instructors. And so we have a project that we're just looking at right now um, that will explore um, the various facets um, that, that um, lead to a strong sense of belonging um, and then uh, make recommendations to changes to the way we operate both as a learning institution and as, for example, a student affairs unit, so that we are um, behaving and acting and designing our programs in a way that will promote a um, sense of belonging for students with disabilities and faculty and staff, actually. Arlene. Uh, so I'm, yeah, just to go back to answering the first question, uh, I think we're uh, approaching it from a very broad way, but I think just to be a little bit more specific about Okanagan, because the Okanagan um, and Vancouver campuses, the CFA DRC, we operate similarly, but we do have some differences. Um, we have about a thousand students that um, that we supported this year that accessed our services, and uh, we have some slightly different programming that we that we support on our campus. So we have um, we offer ADHD coaching for students we see a high number of students with ADHD types of disabilities and so we do have a contract with an ADHD coach so we offer that we also offer um, a program that specifically for students who may be on the autism spectrum and that really gets more individualized supports and helps with transition and find that sense of belonging into a university setting so we have a couple of those types of programs along with we do the similar things that they do in, in Vancouver with our accessibility advisors who are determining what accommodations students might, might need. Um, and we have an exam team that, you know, we, we administer thousands of um, invigilated or accommodated exams every term. And uh, so we do sort of those same basic things and maybe some slightly different programming on our campuses. Thank you so much, Janet and Erlene. 
So uh, I'm going in roughly alphabetical order. So with last name, Shirley, uh, you're next. So what do inclusive and accessible practices look like in your context and your role? Great. Thank you, Christina. And thanks for this invite to be a uh, part of this panel and have this very important discussion. Um, first, let me um, also acknowledge that today I'm on the Vancouver campus um, on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. I'm here with much gratitude. Um, but I think as Christina said, it's uh, more than gratitude that is needed. We have to each of us acknowledge our responsibility, as I do uh, both personally and as a member of this institution to advance um, in everything that I do here, um, advance uh, Indigenous human rights. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, 2009, came back to UBC after uh, doing a couple of degrees here, um, established the Ombuds Office, um, established the Ombuds Office on the Okanagan campus, uh, 2013, I believe it was. Um, my background is in law, uh, did uh, um, several years at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and then worked in professional regulation before I uh, came here to UBC to do this strange work called ombuds work. Uh, of course, it's not in everyone's vernacular, um, but in terms of what we do to uh, promote accessibility and inclusion, um, the central mandate of the Ombuds Office is to promote fairness for students, both individually and at that systemic level. And at both of these levels, what we try to do is um, foster a concept of fairness that's um, inextricably tied to notions of access to justice, um, equity and inclusion. Um, and that's because um, we take the position that at UBC, um, fairness has to be informed not only by the legal principles um, that are embedded in administrative law that talk to us about what fairness is, um, but it also needs to be shaped by UBC's strategic commitments to uh, EDI, to accessibility, to Indigenous human rights, uh, to student health and well-being and sustainability and all these other strategic commitments and promises that we've made. Um, so when we are uh, helping students individually or advising university um, uh, on policies or procedures, uh, we are working from this um, fundamental and, and, and legal definition of fairness um, that is um, centered on uh, the concepts of flexibility and diversity, uh, where fairness does not mean sameness, where fairness requires um, uh, a consideration of uh, the individual circumstances of that particular case, and where fairness uh, reflects uh, the diverse, uh, diverse lived experiences um, of people. So in the UBC context, uh, we think, and this is the message that we try to advance um, on, the, on both of the campuses, um, that we can only achieve fairness uh, when we purposely and purposefully acknowledge the uh, continued uh, damage and oppression that's caused by the colonial structures in which we all work and live and play um, and teach. And when we also purposefully acknowledge that our structures and our systems that we all have to operate in are inherently and very robustly uh, patriarchal, um, ableist, um, and racist. So when we want to work towards um, helping students on that individual level, helping the university at that institutional level to advance accessibility and inclusion, we're looking through the fairness lens. So we look at policies and processes and decisions. Are they transparent? Are they understandable? Can students find information and the criteria upon which decisions made against them are made? We want to hold the university accountable to that. Um, and just as Janet said, it's not just about physical accessibility, but it's about that sense of belonging and inclusivity uh, because you have to have the capacity to be able to access spaces and resources and fully engage in learning. Um, we also look um, at faculty and staff. Do they have the support? Do they have the training? Do they have the skill sets and the competencies 
needed to meet these requirements of procedural fairness in this broader framing. So that includes things like a trauma-informed approach, um, understanding and a commitment to anti-racism, intercultural competencies, all of that has to fit into our frame of treating students fairly. Um, so I was just thinking back, uh, there was a wonderful um, student panel at the beginning of this week. Um, and I believe it was uh, Corin who said, you know, as long as there are accommodation requests and concession requests, UBC is tr not truly accessible. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say about our role is that what we're working towards is um, a university where you will no longer need an ombuds office because we have the policies, the practices, the competencies to treat students fairly in this inclusive um, and equitable way. Thanks for that. Thank you so much, Shirley. So up next, we have Jenny de Parjan, who's a Director, Center for Equitable Systems Design and Extended Learning. So what does, uh, what do inclusive and accessible practices look like in your context or your role? All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Christina and Jeff, for the invitation to be here. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jonita Paul Rajan, and I'm the Director at the Center for Equitable Systems Design. Uh, my office is in the UBC Vancouver campus and uh, I'm working from home now and both places are located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And um, as a settler, a woman of color from a colonized background and through the work and the programs and the courses that we have at the center, um, I'm trying to learn more about my and our relationship to the land to the indigenous people here and uh, uh, and even our own identities uh, and responsibilities as settlers uh, and uh, trying to think about how to make it even more meaningful uh, than uh, you know what we have been doing so far. Um, so, and in my role uh, at uh, the center, uh, I lead the fully online non-credit uh, courses and programs in equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism and um, these are um, these are courses and programs that cater to professionals and adult learners from across various sectors like health, education, uh, businesses, nonprofits, the government sector, um, uh, service industries, uh, international organizations, and so on. And our participants are uh, their consultants, coaches, um, human resources professionals, and uh, basically um, uh, people from all across the various levels in an organization. And um, they're mostly from BC, Canada, and uh, some of them from the US and some from outside. Um, so that's the, the audience, that's the group that we work with. And uh, what would inclusive practices look like in my role, um, given that we are catering to this audience and we're uh, looking at EDI and anti-racism education. So one of the things is, um, one of the primary things is UBC is a primarily white institution and very Eurocentric. So uh, when, we, when we think about EDI education, the first thing that uh, came to my mind with this, um, and I'm, I'm focusing, focusing specifically on the uh, newer UBC Senate approved equity, diversity, inclusion certificate that we offer. Uh, it's about a year old. And one of the main things is for us, um, we needed to make sure that every course in the program, every new course in the program was developed and designed by indigenous black people of color, uh, course developers. And so we may, we've been very intentional about it to make sure that we are bringing in their voices. Uh, the resources we use within the courses are also primarily reflective of the perspectives and lived experiences of um, uh, indigenous black people of color. and. Um, uh, and also, uh, we found that a lot of the scholarship in this area tends to be from the United States, and uh, we wanted to ensure that we were creating a space where um, Indigenous people, Black people, people of color from within our context here were being heard and uh, were being highlighted and amplified. And so that was something that we were very intentional in doing. Um, the other thing that we also do is when it comes to facilitation, um, our facilitators are educators, they're practitioners, and they're activists. And so 
they bring in diverse life experiences and identities and uh, their role in the courses is to facilitate conversations and on um, these tough topics and nudge people towards uh, by asking them open-ended questions and uh, trying to create um, a scenario and model um, cultural humility uh, empathy and curiosity at the same time. So um, it's a very interesting uh, model uh, and there is no one central person in the course, but we try to um, we try to create a space where these it's, it feels like, even though it's online, it feels like it's a conversation that's happening in someone's living room. And so the facilitators are very key to that, to this work um, and, um, um, and uh, it's um, it's amazing just the amount of skill that they bring into uh, the space. Um, and then within the online space itself, um, you know, it's not, uh, you know, like things just like in cyberspace, like what are the boundaries? What are the, you know, how do you define uh, relationships and so on? Um, and so we try to aim, we, we try to have a flatter hierarchy uh, within our courses by focusing on peer learning because people come from various backgrounds, various walks of life. And sometimes we can have someone who is a CEO of an organization learning alongside somebody who is a brand new employee who has just entered the workforce. And so we want to create that flatter hierarchy so we can learn with each other. Um, and we also, uh, the facilitators also encourage that uh, flatter hierarchy. And we ask people to focus on their own stories, take ownership of their own learning, maintain confidentiality where needed. Um, and um, um, and oftentimes when they facilitate these conversations, it, it kind of reveals our own biases and our own uncertainties about inclusion and equity, even though we come in thinking, you know, yeah, I really love EDI work. And, but then it just surface, it brings to the surface some of our own hesitations um, and uh, areas of growth. And um, so this is where peer learning comes in useful because it helps build a container where participants can grow in awareness and explore at the same time how they can use their skills to reduce injustices uh, in their own workplace. Um, given this new awareness. So uh, it's a, it, it has to be like the space is held very carefully uh, and very thoughtfully. And when it comes to coursework uh, as well, um, we use the head, uh, head, hands, heart metaphor. <laughs> we invite uh, people to focus on theoretical, uh, theoretical framework and at the end, um, practical application and self-reflection because most participants who come into the course, they're working and uh, they want something that they can take to work with them. Uh, and it, they, you know, they're very curious um, and the, they need to have a short turnaround time. So what they learn over the weekend, they may need to practice it when they show up at work on Monday morning. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be huge uh, changes, but it could be very small, but meaningful steps that they might take. So we try to uh, keep the learning uh, centered around application as much as possible. Um, and um, uh, just to give an example, we had a person in, um, in uh, one of our courses uh, a year ago uh, who was, um, um, you know, she was working, she was responsible for working with a group of, with a, with the leadership in her organization, a group of white folks uh, uh, around allegations of racism. And she was, she was stuck. Um, she didn't know the, she was stuck. She knew she was missing something, but didn't know what it was. And uh, so they were having these discussions and then um, the assignments are due on Sunday. And so she had this aha moment uh, on a Sunday uh, and realized that she had been focusing on their intent. And uh, so, you know, she was going through, oh, but they didn't mean that. Uh, they would not have, oh, maybe it was a misunderstanding. And so she's focusing on the intent and really missed seeing the impact on uh, the racialized folks and the organization. And so uh, that was an aha moment. And so even that, like it's a small, meaningful change and that taking it to work with her uh, over the week that, you know, changes things for the organization. So um, that's kind of how we hold the space, try to make it inclusive. Um, and, um, uh, you know, yes, we have policies, we have, uh, you know, from an operations perspective, we have uh, policies in place, and yet we kind of approach it on a case-by-case -case basis as much as we can, because again, with adult learners, uh, life happens. They are working multiple jobs. Sometimes they have life commitments, so 
uh, how can we show up and support them uh, as much as we possibly can. So uh, those are some of the things that we do uh, to try to make the space inclusive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. So next up we have Brad Weatherick, who's Associate Provost Academic Programs Teaching and Learning at UBC Okanagan. So same question, what do inclusive and accessible practices look like in your context or role, or how do you promote inclusion? Thanks, Christina. Tanse, Brad Weatherick, Nisikason. Mitchif, Nia, Edmonton, Nia, Okanagan, we can, my name is Brad Weatherick. I'm the Associate Provost Academic Programs Teaching and Learning in, in the Okanagan. I am Métis. I am from Edmonton, the Edmonton area originally, and, and I currently have the pleasure of um, playing, living, working as an unseated guest, or as, a, as, an, um, as an uninvited guest on the unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan peoples. Um, <clears throat> when I think about um, inclusive and accessible practices, from the perspective of the provost office, and 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 I should say uh, that I, within my role, I do oversee the Center for Teaching and Learning in the Okanagan. I'm part of kind of uh, broadly overseeing uh, significant aspects of teaching and learning, including some of how we think about and 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 frame our design of learning spaces, our learning technology governance, our uh, academic program planning and, and quality assurance processes, um, as well as the support that we provide for grad students and faculty. So huge um, spectrum of work um, associated with this, this question. Um, I wrote down kind of seven key things that jumped to my mind, and these are all huge, and they're all areas where we could dive deep into and, and have deep conversations about um, how how we should be improving our practices around accessibility and inclusivity. Um, the first one is, that I wrote down was the design of infrastructure. So physically, how are we designing our spaces, our classrooms? Uh, how are we creating, um, uh, uh, you know, how is our learning infrastructure actually enabling us to be inclusive and accessible? The second area was kind of the functionality and, and use of our learning technology tools. How are we ensuring that there are uh, that our tools are accessible, that we're actually meeting kind of the expectations and needs of students, um, uh, you know, across the spectrum of the, the, the technology tools that we, we use for learning. Uh, the third one was the design of our courses and, and ranging from as big a question as the modalities that we use to teach um, online, in person, and the spectrum in between. Uh, to, you know, the approaches that we use to design our courses. Um, uh, and our programs for that matter using you know, from a perspective of universal design for learning and culturally responsive pedagogies and and how we actually embed um, um, uh, inclusive and accessible practices uh, in the work that we do. Um, the fourth one was the materials that we choose, the content of our courses that we were preparing are, are, and how we're actually ensuring that that content is accessible, that, that, that the um, the content is inclusive. Um, fifth was the pedagogical practices that we choose to implement in our teaching practices. Um, so the ways in which we're actually um, um, approaching the learning experiences for our students and the ways in which we actually create inclusive and accessible environments. Um, six was the assessment practices we use. So the ways that we're actually ass ass uh, assessing learning and whether or not we're actually doing assessment in ways that enables accessibility and inclusivity. And, and finally, I, I wrote down the, the policy framework for teaching and learning as an as a institutional structure. And so the ways in which we actually think about um, inclusivity and accessibility from, from the perspective of the policies that we have in place to support the teaching and learning environment. So all of these things that, 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 that encompasses like the full spectrum of work that we do in teaching and learning as a campus, but each of these are areas that we need to be paying attention to as, as we move forward. And, and so, you know, to, to jump back to the question, um, you know, I think it was said earlier uh, in the panel um, that a default assumption that we need to make and then understand is that that generally the history of higher education in Canada, the history of higher education within UBC 
is Eurocentric, is patriarchal, is heteronormative, is ableist, and, and has created a number of different ways, through a number of different ways, systemic barriers for, for learners um, across our, our institution, across the disciplines. Um, so how do we begin to tackle that? And so understanding um, that this, this work encompasses accessibility and disability and broadly equity, diversity, inclusivity and, and indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous perspectives that, that we need to be thinking about and the, the intersectional identities and practices that, that are within and between these different kind of ideas or these different um, areas of focus. Um, so that's <laughs> all that to say that the, the, the work in front of us as we think about creating accessible and inclusive practices is 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 big it's huge there, there's a lot of um areas that we could actually begin to focus on so um within the um my own practices and uh, so i'm i am an educator i'm um you know, I spent many years now leading centers for teaching and learning, and and I'm I'm um, you know the part uh, of I've been working um, with uh, you know people across the disciplines around the design of of inclusive and accessible courses for for a number of years. Um, so, from my perspective, I think you know I always like to, to frame this question around. The contexts that are within our control. So, as as an individual instructor, I'm not likely going to be able to control the design of classrooms that are that are in in place. So, so so from that perspective, I I you know when I think about inclusive practices as as an individual instructor, I I'm likely not trying to tackle that one. Although I may be actually coming up with strategies to mitigate. The shortcomings of the physical infrastructure that I that that I am working in, I'm not likely to influence the institutional choice of learning technology tools as an individual instructor. But again, I can actually choose which parts of tools I use or or which tools I I, I want to use um, to to meet the the goals that I have from from an accessibility perspective. But what is very much in the control of individual instructors is is the actual design of their classes, the pedagogical strategies that they they choose to implement, and the and the assessment practices that they're that they're choosing. And so, so when I've worked with with faculty around trying to advance inclusive and accessible practices, a lot of my effort has really been thinking about how do we support uh, the interrogation of our learning outcomes to make sure that we actually are thinking about. <clears throat> inclusivity and accessibility as as a core component of, of how we define those learning outcomes. Um, how do we then align our, our the strategies we use in class, whether it be discussions or experiential learning opportunities or or whatever whatever kind of teaching strategies we might use um, within our work? How are we aligning that to ensure that we're meeting accessibility and inclusivity goals? And then, and then the one that I think is actually often overlooked the most is actually the assessment practices that we choose and the ways in which we design assessments to be to be inclusive and accessible. Um, so those are kind of the high level things that kind of jump to my mind. Um, I, I do, um, you know, like I said, I could dive deep into each one of the seven things I talked about and spend significant amounts of time talking uh, about the ways in which we might be approaching, um, you know, improving accessibility, um, you know, the ways in which we th need to think about governance and policy, the ways we need to think about the, the specific design of infrastructure and the, and the choices of learning technology tools and the way we assess them. But I think that kind of Covers the at a high level kind of the the teaching and learning framing that I think that is that is really important as we as we try to uh, grapple with this question about what does inclusive and accessible practices look like. So um, I'll uh, stop there and pass it back to you, Christina. So. Thank you so much, Brad. So our last panelist is Mai Yasue from who's uh, the interim director of education partnerships and engagement at the Equity and Inclusion Office in UBC Vancouver. So also, what do inclusive and accessible practices look like in your context or your role? 
Um, thank you, and thank you to the panelists. Um, I hope I'll echo many of the similar points. But um, so I'm calling in from Nachlelchem on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, and I'm an East Asian woman with mid-length hair, gray sweater, um, with a background image, and my lovely pet ducks. Um, I was a geography faculty member for 13 years. Um, prior to taking on this role, I worked mostly on um, small-scale, community-based conservation projects. Um, and <clears throat> so I work for, I'm the interim director for the education partnership and engagement team. So this is, I wanted to like just start and be like, this is what I want to tell people about what we do in the equity office. <laughs> so, um, so the education partnership and engagement team is the team that sort of embeds practices related to equity and inclusion within the, the different academic and non-academic units throughout the university. So we're in a, we're, we support in this embedding. Um, and there's all these like strategic plans and recommendations from the IAP, the ISP and ARIES task force recommendations that have come up and many others too, that sort of like tell the broad direction of the units, uh, where the units need to go. But the precise details of actually action actioning these requires quite a lot of capacity building and support. Um, and as y'all are probably realizing right now, um, considerations related to inclusion, equity, justice, access, decolonization, and indigenization touches on everything that you do within a unit, which is kind of overwhelming. Um, and so I feel like I'm very often when I'm meeting with people, I'm kind of saying broadly the same thing, but it's basically this. It's like, I just am trying to remind people, we're trying to remind people, this is part of your job, like, all of your jobs from faculty leadership staff to TAs. Second, it's really hard and a bit awkward, we know. And then third, we're here to provide support and you can totally do this. And then we try to like connect people to the community of people because I know departments can be a little siloed to all the other people who are doing this amazing work across the university so that you can be inspired by exemplars, which we know is really important and feel like you can succeed. Um, and so we spend a lot of time consulting with individuals, especially people who are championing EDI within their units, um, as well as people in formal leadership roles. Um, and mo mostly we like work to hear like, what are the challenges that people are facing? Um, and then provide some tips and strategies on what might work in their unique sort of sociocultural climate. That's what departments often are. Um, and so, you know, like a good educator, I don't want you to see us as like the diversity police. I don't want people to be afraid of me or the equity office. Um, I like to think of our role as building relationships to help people feel intrinsically motivated to create change. Um, and so my, I, I think my role is largely about working to create a supportive context so that people feel intrinsically motivated to engage in social cultural change. Um, and I also don't want to, that to be like us, the equity office being the EDI for your unit, because that puts the onus on us rather than keeping you on the hook to build your internal capacity and resources and enact changes um, within your processes. Um, and so we, we, have, we often get these come to our unit and spend 30 minutes and talk about racism so that we can check off anti-racism for our work and say we're doing something. And then I'm like, mm, can we figure out a way in which we can help you build your internal capacity and and have a greater sense of ownership on this work um, to make the changes. Um, and if this takes many, many conversations to inspire people who are in positions of power to take ownership and take on this path, um, that's both positive for Jedi and also feels meaningful for the folks within the unit, then that's what we do. Um, and, you know, like there's always a space for like straight up sort of education, like being like a workshop or something like that. And especially if the chances of, of people implementing this education is very high. Like I think Rachel Sullivan in our office does these ongoing TA trainings. Um, and TAs are great because they're kind of new to teaching and pretty open and excited about learning about these topics. And so, you know, you're likely to get pretty good, you know, from transition from awareness to action, which is what we always want. Um, so that's sort of gives you some idea of the type of work that we're doing. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we do have a second question. I also want to be sure to leave time for um, questions and thoughts from our participants. So I'm wondering if maybe we can sort of pick a little, you know, one, one piece of the second question and, and um, 
um, move a little bit quickly. So there's, there's time left. So the second question is, what are existing systematic barriers or key challenges that students, staff, and faculty with disabilities face or other kinds of systemic barriers of which we know there are many? How are you or your unit and UPC initiatives working to address or overcome these barriers? So maybe I don't want to say pick the, you know, one um, <laughs> that is the most important because there are so many, right? But but maybe just think about, about one that, that you might like to emphasize today. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit and start with Jonita this time, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I have um, one example that comes to mind and it's um, one of the biggest systemic barriers for our learners was around affordability and time because they're working you know, multiple jobs lots of things going on um, and our usual courses are six weeks long and uh, they cost around a thousand bucks and so we decided um, that we needed to make uh, our courses more affordable and then create more pathways for people to be for more people to be able to take them and so we decided we'd make shorter courses um, that could be stacked towards a certificate if they were interested for a lower price point and so instead of 40 hour long course options, now we have a suite of new courses that are about 15 hours long and um, takes about approximately two to three weeks to complete them. And they cost around 400 bucks. So we went from thousand to 400. And so while this opened the doors for more people to access our programs and get a UBC credential, uh, it also posed some new challenges for us. <laughs> The volume of learners coming in at a time increased exponentially, but the expectations remained the same. So the expectations for a $400 course was the same as a $1,000 course. So, I mean, this is just a joke, but uh, I like I think of it as, you know, paying for the days in, but expecting a Ritz-Carlton treatment. <laughs> and so we're currently trying to figure out how we can meet the demand and also ensure that expectations and the amount of service we provide per course is also sustainable for us and for our facilitators. Yeah, so that's one barrier. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Shirley, would you like to go next? Surprise, uh, Tapa. I'm, sorry. I'm jumping <laughs> no, around. No, not at all, not at all. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll just say that uh, the, the systemic barriers that come to our office, you know, they, they come in all shapes and sizes, as we all know, but I'll talk to the recurring and sort of common elements that we see beneath those systemic barriers. And uh, one thing that it reveals to us is that um, the rules and processes and policies that we have at UBC, they weren't created, nor do they align with UBC strategic commitments to EDI, to Indigenous human rights, to student health and well-being. And secondly, the other recurring element that we see from the barriers is a rigid and inflexible interpretation of those rules that um, protect historical uh, power um, hierarchies that are generally based on this misunderstanding of fairness that you have to treat everybody the same. And the same aligns with the standard of the white, able-bodied, heterosexual, um, not poor and mentally well person. So treat everybody the same at that standard. Um, so from what we're seeing in this moment in time, I think we're at a place where we have the opportunity to make a paradigm shift here. And instead of looking at how do we increase resources to, um, um, deal with all these um, different concessions and accommodations and changes and flexing, it's time now to look at the framework itself and stop thinking about the students who are making these requests as being the problem or somehow um, not meeting the level of the university and saying, you know what, we're so overwhelmed with these issues it's time to look inside and at the framework itself and say, we've got to shift the framework. Um, it's not about um, students becoming more resilient. Stop telling students to become more resilient. It's time for the institution to change its system so that we don't have to keep telling students to get stronger 
or uh, work faster. Um, and just in, in time, I, I thought uh, when I was listening again to the student panel earlier this week, they were just so fantastic. But one student was talking about um, getting extra time to write exams. And I thought, well, you know, whose standard um, did we establish the three hour exam time? Or um, whose sense of time or capacity or privilege were those decisions made? And if we can't go back to those decisions and give good reasons for it, as in the ombuds world, we say fairness requires good reasons. We have to go back to those decisions themselves and critically evaluate and critically challenge some of these rules that have been in place for decades and say, maybe it's time to change the standard and try to meet the needs of our diverse uh, population of students. Thank you so much, Shirley. Um, how about uh, Arlene and Janet are kind of doing a, a tag team? <laughs> on yes. a second. I just oh, want to say um, that I, I sort of echo what Shirley is saying. I think the policies that exist currently don't necessarily align with the, the new and evolving um, the, the plans that are coming out and the, the ideas that UBC wants to be more, uh, it wants to be inclusive and, and, and action those things when the policies are grounded in like centuries old ideas around pedagogy and what is, an, what is academic, what is an academic. And so uh, the barriers that I see, I'm gonna try to be brief, the barriers that I see really stem from working and, and studying a, in a system that is really grounded in ableism, that dictates to us without us even understanding that it's doing so, what does a student look like? What does a faculty member, what does an instructor look like? What do they do? What are they capable of? And those things are just sort of defined for us through this ableist lens. And then we're making decisions about all kinds of things based on what we think, what we've been sort of socialized and grounded in thinking of what it is to be a student or, or, or an instructor or staff member at the university. So I think there's some alignment that needs to happen. Um, and I know in culture change and those things don't happen overnight and they take time, but I think these kinds of discussions and, and the awareness, the growing awareness that's happening are the things that we need to be doing and engaging in to make those changes. And I would just, uh, again, echo like decision makers really need to rethink kind of how they're making their decisions and on what basis they're making decisions. So that's my little soapbox. Okay, well, I'll climb on mine. Um, so so I, I think I'm probably coming at this just from a exactly the same, but a slightly different angle to say that I think that the greatest systemic barrier that we face uh, to inclusion, particularly for people with disabilities, is our own attitudes um, uh, and the attitudinal barriers that that are created by our actions. Um, and, and it shows up in, in multiple different ways. One, it, it can show up in even the assumptions around what, what a person, how a person with a disability presents or, or who is a person with a disability. And, and you know, often we think of, of disabilities being something that is visible that we can identify um, as we look at a person or we talk with a person. And, and at the Center for Accessibility, for example, I think, and the DRC on both on the Okanagan campus, the majority, the vast majority of people we see are people with invisible disabilities um, for whom, uh, unless you know them intimately, you would never be able to tell that, that, that they would identify as a person with a disability. And so um, that's one of the pieces. This, the second is around the assumptions we make around disability and, and how those then influence our, our behaviors. And, and maybe just the quickest way I can, can articulate that would be a I was interviewed recently um, by uh, CT, CITR, um, and um, and and it was a conversation. And so they were telling me as many stories as I was telling them. And and one of the stories that one of the interviews told was was of wanting to be in medicine or in um, nursing, um, and um, and being told as a person who was hard of hearing that she would not be able to function and, and work as a nurse um, by more than one person. And so, you know, she, it, it was a heartbreaking story, but also a real illustration um, of the fact that, you know, that then leads to um, behaviors from the individual that she's working with, but also her own self, her own um, self, uh, um, 
esteem and her own ability to kind of make decisions for herself. And so, you know, I think if we could get to a place where we understood um, the, the impact of our own attitudes, um, we would be able to really look at some of the other things that others have talked about. So I'll climb off my box and pass it back to you, Christina. Sure, thank you. So just uh, two more folks on the panel who haven't spoken yet to the second question. So Mike, could you speak to some existing systemic barriers or key challenges that students, faculty and staff face? Mm -hmm. Um, so I agree with some of the points that have already made, been made, and I think the main thing is like the onus shouldn't be up to the individual diverse student or person to create change um, and have to force them to, to navigate this really complicated system. It, it is up to the university to create a more hospitable environment for, for these students. Um, and that the main thing that I think about is um, in my role is to support people and shifting the mind, their mindset from a monocultural mindset to one that always assumes that there are diverse students, staff, and faculty. And then, you know, going through what they need to do in order to, in all the processes and all the aspects of their job, whether we're talking about research, service, teaching, and then making changes with that assumption that there will always be people with very different, um, lived experiences and identities. And so within the teaching and learning space, you know, that could be things like ensuring that instructors tell students about all the different affinity spaces that exist um, at UBC or support systems that that units that exist at UBC, perhaps on their syllabus or in making that available or on the first week of classes. Um, maybe it's about designing assessments, like what Brad said, um, that aren't based on a single high stakes exam that evaluates just one type of learning um, or ensuring really like that you're setting up your class in a super welcoming way in the first week of class. So, so that if something comes up, they're, you're, that they're, they'll feel comfortable talking to you. Um, or maybe it's about introducing to your students in the first week of classes, like an inclusive, equitable, transparent process for resolving conflicts within your class or making it clear how you want feedback, that you're open to feedback and that you're, you want how you want feedback um, when say I do something as an instructor that isn't super sensitive. Um, and then beyond the traditional classes, there's all these other considerations that, that units need to be thinking about, which are like, how do you create inclusion in labs? What are you doing in terms of field courses, developing co-op programs? Um, and then of course, beyond that, um, when we're thinking about the beyond what changes facu individual faculty members need to be making, um, there's also things that need to be done at more of the leadership role of like how to evaluate effectiveness in teaching practices, um, as well as more broadly, like how are you considering inclusive teaching within performance review of faculty? Or similarly, um, you know, are you using inclusive practices and principles of universal design? Um, and providing information about these types of supports for onboarding for all faculty and staff, um, as well as during hiring and recruitment. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind. Thanks so much. And Brad, can you let us know about some one or, one or more of the many, unfortunately, uh, systemic barriers? <laughs> yeah, so I, in, in, I, when I think about systemic barriers, I always think about um, the barriers faced on the pathways into, uh, during, or, or through the learning experiences and beyond our learning experiences, and the, the barriers that are faced throughout that full spectrum of, of work. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to touch on specifically thinking about the moment we're in. So the moment that we're in as an institution, um, after two years of extremely difficult circumstances. Um, uh, but, you know, as, as difficult as those, you know, these years have been for, for our learners, um, there are some things that have been highlighted um, through this, this experience that, that I think are, are really um, valuable to learn. And so, um, you know, we've heard regularly from students about how much they appreciated the flexibility and access that was provided by the use of the different technologies that, that we've been using uh, during this time. Um, to give one specific example, the number of uh, students who have actually um, uh, 
uh, you know, been able to access um, ca classroom capture recordings as a way of actually supporting their learning experiences. And so, so this is just a very micro example of kind of the, the specific moment we're in, but, you know, this during, um, if, you, if you've been following along the teaching and learning world over the last uh, two years, there's this, this idea has been talking about this idea of pandemic pedagogy. So what does it look like for us to actually think about pedagogy in the moment that, that we're in with the pandemic? And it, and it started really with this idea of, you know, what does it really mean to move learning remote? And how do we actually think about designing spaces, designing learning in those environments? But increasingly that literature, that, that those conversations, the dialogue and discussion happening is, is focused on actually how some of those technologies are in use, yes, but also how are we actually thinking about empathy and compassion as core philosophies for how we're actually approaching the learning environment. And so many of our institutions actually uh, implemented and, and UBC is no exception, different practices around kind of um, uh, where we, we, we centered kind of empathy and compassion in, in the work that we do with, with learners. And, and so I've, I've actually written recently on this idea of actually moving to endemic pedagogy. So rather than pandemic pedagogy, thinking about this, this future of an endemic world where, um, you know, COVID is likely never, we're never going to be beyond COVID, but, but actually using this kind of metaphor of endemic to say, well, what was the, what were these benefits that we took from this past experience and how do we actually sustain them moving forward? How do we actually center flexibility and access into the, the ways that we design our programs and our courses how do we center empathy and compassion in the practices that we um, are, are putting into place as instructors or into the policies in, in our campuses how do we ensure that relationships are at the core of learning so that that we can actually enable kind of the deep holistic education that that we that we want to aim for and and it means teaching and designing differently um, and so that's a, um, in a really broad um, perspective, but I wanted to end my, my reflections on this one to talk about the fact that it's really easy to talk about all the things that faculty and programs need to, to, to think about. Um, but, but to do this, we really need to understand, recognize and support the, the systemic barriers faced by faculty themselves to, to doing this work. And, and so, you know, not just faculty with disabilities and, and BIPOC faculty where, for whom there are, there are, you know, many systemic barriers to them to, that, that they face, but, but, you know, all faculty are facing issues associated with time and well-being. And, and uh, it was just mentioned how we are evaluating teaching, um, you know, on our campuses. So actually we need to think about, you know, how are we actually enabling um, our faculty and supporting our faculty to transition into this kind of um, uh, this future where we actually try to center empathy and compassion and inclusivity and accessibility in into the work that we do moving forward. And, and so I think, you know, it, it, it is it is critical that across our institution, we're putting the learner at the center of kind of these conversations and how we're actually um, you know, reducing barriers and uh, to those pathways into, through, and beyond our, our programs. But to do that, we need to also be really emphasizing the, the ways in which we reduce the barriers faced by faculty to actually do this work effectively and, and to support them effectively to do this work. So I'll, I'll end there and I look forward to questions and from, the, from those who are in attendance today. So. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly rich and, and I, I really appreciate the different experiences and perspectives from all of the different areas of your work that you've been able to bring. And we've got some similar ideas, but also some very um, specific ones that uh, you know folks may not have thought about before. So thank you so much. And I uh, just wanted to add on to Brad's, um, you know, we, we do have to think about all of us in the institution as well, right? So us, <laughs> right, leaders um, and also staff members too, and students and faculty, like the, there's barriers that, um, that uh, lots of folks are, are facing and, and this is challenging work. So I would like to open it up now for um, uh, anyone from the participant group who would like to uh, ask a question. You can do so in one of two ways. You can post something into the Zoom chat 
Um, and we have a Q&A facilitator, Jillian Gerhardt, who will be um, looking at the chat and, and reading those out loud. Or you can raise your hand um, if you're using the Zoom reactions button at the bottom of your screen, and you can speak on the microphone if you'd like to do it that way. And I'll be uh, doing the um, I'll be doing the oral questions and uh, Jillian will be reading the Zoom questions. So please uh, go ahead. Um, see, I do see a comment in the chat, which I will read out. So thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of thank yous um, for all the time and efforts. We have also for Brad particularly, thank you for acknowledging the faculty and staff's role in creating an inclusive institution. At HR, we say that student experience does not exceed faculty and staff experience. And then we have a second of that. So thank you so much. So questions from anyone participating? Well, I can also just say if there was anything that um, you wanted to say that, you know, because we were going a bit quickly through that second question, if there's anything you wanted to add about the barriers or how you're addressing the barriers or respond to something that anyone else on the panel said while we're waiting to see if there are questions from the participants. Oh, I do see a hand up, so we'll go with that. Um, please go ahead, Juan. Um, hello, thank, thanks so much for uh, this wonderful uh, panels and or sh sharing of your uh, perspectives and experiences, really appreciate it. I am, uh, I just have a, um, I think one, there were a couple of you who talked about the attitudes and assumptions as one of the barriers. And I was thinking about how also uh, our attitudes uh, and assumptions um, also shape and are shaped by uh, language that we use in practice, in policies, in documents, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I was just wondering uh, if, if any of you just would like to maybe speak to how, uh, how you see the, the role of language uh, in practices and in policies and how, how, it, uh, how we could be also more aware of how language plays a role uh, in in um, uh, uh, increasing uh, accessibility and inclusive uh, culture in in our practices and in our, our policies in, or in many other uh, 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 ways that we we can uh, uh, contribute to more more inclusive more accessible culture. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. I'll throw it out to the panel and see. Anyone would like to start? Brad. Just to emphasize that you're, I, I would 100% agree that I think language absolutely influences um, attitudes and practices um, that the, um, the language used um, as part of the discourse of our, of our campus or, our, or the subcultures of our departments. Um, uh, certainly influences the ways in which courses are designed and, and pedagogical practices are implemented and assessment practices are implemented. The, the language in our policies clearly um, uh, influences those, those attitudes and practices as well. And so I think um, attending to language is one of those um, pieces that I think is, is uh, critical at, at all aspects of, of this work. Um, when we, when we talk about kind of reframing the policy framework for our campus around inclusivity and accessibility, we need to really be um, you know, mindful of, of the, the ways in which even you know, individual words within those policies can actually serve as uh, both enablers or barriers to actually achieving the goals that we're trying to, to achieve. And so um, it does, uh, I, I, that's not to say I, uh, any, simple or profound kind of response to, to your question, but just to assert or to affirm that, that I think you, it's absolutely critical that that language uh, is attended to in this work, so. Thanks, Brad. Anyone else like to add? I, I was just gonna say maybe to, to build on that, that, you know, I, I, um, 
the concept of disability itself is is socially constructed, right? Like it it's so you're absolutely right. The the language we use is is based on our assumptions and and our understanding of a concept that that we are have formed as a part of our social understanding of of um, identity. Um, I, I think the other the other piece that and, and I know in in our work in the Center for Accessibility, we really struggle um, in making sure that um, when it comes to um, accessing the resources that we have available, that people recognize themselves in the in the name of the unit and in the way that we position ourselves. And so many years ago, and and this is not a um, a criticism of the the name Disability Resource Center, but but we made a decision on the Vancouver campus, um, given some of the struggles that we were facing around making sure that um, all individuals, whether they recognized or identified themselves as a person with a disability, knew about this the resources that were available. We switched to being the Center for Accessibility. So we switched to a title that reflected our ambition um, as a center and as an, as an institution on the Vancouver campus. Um, rather than identifying the people that we were um, supporting. And, and a part of that was to recognize that some people with um, ongoing medical conditions that may be facing barriers would not consider themselves to be a person with a disability and therefore may not have accessed our services. So it's just a simple example of where language played a role for us in, in whether or not people came forward um, to, to identify seeking resources. Thanks, Janet. I also see my head up. And um, I just wanted to mention like one very concrete, discrete example is like the language that's in job descriptions. I mean, in many ways, I focus so much on hiring because it's like how uh, search committees are talking about hiring and what kind of decisions they make. It's just like a microcosm of all the cultural changes that need to happen in your unit in order to get to an inclusive and equitable place. But I always think about like, oh man, UBC, you always have to use like outstanding, like the language they use is always like, I, I get it. You probably want outstanding people, but certain kinds of people are going to feel that they fit that mold of being outstanding more than others. And that in itself is going to create such a barrier from certain groups of people like, oh, I don't need, like if you're my equity deserving group or you, you know, or you're neurodiverse or whatever, you're like, well, maybe I, I can't really label myself with outstanding. So I'll just sit back and won't apply. So um, there's so many parts of that. And I know there's like a lot of literature on like gendered language, which is also part of it. If you write it in a very gendered way, it's like, oh, this is only meant for men. That's fine. I'm not going to apply. But um, I think that's a really good example. And also like, yeah, that and I think of like the language that we put in syllabi of like writing language that assumes that we're all coming in from different places. And I think that kind of thing is a very concrete thing that we can do. Great. Thank you. Arlene. Hi. I just, I, I think I, uh, I just wanted to add to what Janet said and just, just acknowledge that what's in the disability community that the, the word disability is like a person first or so whether you use disabled person or person with disability, those are preferred languages and they're quite contested. There's no, I, I don't think there's any wrong. Like it's not wrong. For one person it might be wrong, to another person it might be right, right? So language and discourse really informs um, our, our practices uh, in a, it, it, tremendously, probably more than we even understand and acknowledge. And so we're always very careful around language, but we all aren't always going to get it right. It doesn't matter. Like we're not going to get it right for everybody, right? So, um, and I think, but we need to be really intentional, I think, in, in our language, whether it's in our job postings or in our uh, websites, in, in, the, in the way that we speak with people, the way that we acknowledge people. I think, you know, it's really important and it, 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 it reflects sort of like the, the values and the beliefs that as a, as a person or even from an institutional perspective that we hold when we're talking about accessibility and inclusion. That's it for me. Thank you. So uh, Mai has just put into the chat a link to a resource on language and job descriptions. It's from the University of Nottingham um, towards diverse workforces, transforming the language of exclusion and bias and recruitment. So thank you so much for including that. And we also have a comment about um, language being complex and ever evolving, just sort of 
um, reiterating what you were talking about, Erlene. So there's a current movement for identity first language. Um, so reowning and being proud of being disabled, uh, but not everyone aligns with that. So what's important is to create a culture of inclusion. So thank you for these comments in the chat. Oh, and I think um, Mayu just also put in an actual file. <laughs> I'll have to take a look at that one later. We probably have time for another question if anyone would like to ask a question in the chat or raise your hand and speak. How am I saying this? There's a draft document in the chat that the Equity and Inclusion Office has created that might be interested. So that's about job descriptions, right? Fantastic. Certainly something that affects everyone at the institution. Yeah. I was just going to maybe just to, to reiterate um, Brad's comment. I, I, I do think um, one of the philosophies or, or approaches that we've taken as much as we can is, is to try to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing. And it, and it's a recognition that, you know, I think as an institution, we do aspire um, to creating a welcoming, inclusive, accessible learning and living environment for all. Um, but it, it, it isn't always easy to do so. Um, and when we place the responsibility on individuals um, to um, achieve a, what is an institutional goal or, or vision, um, I think we really lose out. And so, you know, if we can in this process also start to think about what are the institutional resources and practices um, and systems that we can put in place so that instructors or program staff or others can easily achieve, um, uh, contribute to achieving our vision, I, I think we will move much more quickly in, in the direction that we're hoping to go. I appreciate that, thank you. So we're getting close to time. So I think um, I will close out our session. We are meant to end in a couple of minutes. Um, and I wanted to close out by thanking our panelists um, very much for joining us today. It's uh, fantastic to be able to hear from people working in different units and different contexts and uh, hearing about the, the various work that you all do. I'd like to thank our attendees for joining us today for an hour and a half of conversation about accessibility and inclusivity in teaching and learning. Um, thank you to our moderators. There are several folks working behind the scenes, to our event staff who um, have made sure that everything is working smoothly and from start to finish with Celebrate Learning Week. Um, and just to let you know, a follow-up email will be sent to all attendees at the end of this week, so that's coming up very soon, which will include a feedback survey as well as a link to the Celebrate Learning Week wiki page where you can find slides, recordings, and other resources from the sessions. Uh, there are a few more events today and tomorrow in Celebrate Learning Week. Um, so uh, if you would like to check those out, please go to celebratelearning.ubc.ca and it has just been posted in the chat. So celebratelearning.ubc.ca and then click on events. And I also see um, uh, that there's been a few people who had to leave early who asked to express their thanks to the panelists. So thank you, Jillian, for that. Um, yeah, so just a, a quick food for thought. <laughs> There's a lot of great work being done at UBC. Um, a couple colleagues and I are attending sessions, making efforts to incorporate inclusive practices, and it would be great to think of ways to reach the rest of UBC educators. So that's a good parting thought for all of us to consider. So thanks so much for, to everyone for joining us today, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day and week. Thank you.